Director General Azevedo, Ambassador Schwab, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for the WIDA International Trade Conference. My name is Andrew Gelfuso. I'm Vice President of TCMA. TCMA has been running the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for the past two decades in a unique public-private partnership with the U.S. General Services Administration. As the World Trade Center of DC, we connect with 300 World Trade Centers in 100 countries around the world to open doors and connect our local partners around the world. We've placed some palm cards at each seat this morning to announce our newly revamped and updated publication, our own capital trade guide. The guide is designed for small to mid-sized enterprises as they look to navigate through the world of trade. To learn more about this or some of our other trade initiatives, I'd invite you to our booth um, back in the registration area or to visit our website. I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous partnership we've enjoyed with WIDA for the past 20 years. Together, we've offered a neutral forum for the open and robust discussion of international trade policy and related issues. The lineup of speakers participating in today's event are of the highest caliber and speak to the strong programming efforts by Ken and his team. I'd now like to introduce and welcome to the stage the Executive Director of WIDA, Mr. Ken Levinson, who will guide us through the program for today. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here today again. My name is Ken Levinson. I'm the Executive Director of WIDA. We are incredibly pleased to have all of you here today. Special thanks to the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center, Andrew Gelfuso and his team for their support for today's conference and all of WIDA's regular activities throughout the year. Of course, that also includes our annual dinner on July 22nd this year. Uh, as a reminder, our dinner sells out every year, and uh, if you want to get a table, we recommend that you reserve that early. Uh, thanks again, Andrew and Caitlin and the rest of your team for all your help. A uh, special also thanks to the WIDA team, Diego Añez, and our uh, terrific team of interns. You'll have a chance to meet them. Their names are in your program. I hope you get a chance to say hello to them. If there's anything you need, they'll be happy to help you with that. Thanks again for coming on this lovely well, I guess I won't say lovely rainy spring day because it's winter, but I will promise you that we will get you out of here all on time. We will be on time, not like the Iowa caucuses. Um, but um, thinking of the rain, it does remind us that we're going to be starting a series here at WIDA this year looking at trade and environmental issues. So please uh, keep a lookout for that. And as well, coming up on February 28th, we're going to have our congressional trade program again right here in this room. Uh, with the four trade councils from the Ways and Means and Finance Committees. Uh, so we hope to have you here again for that. Thanks to all of our speakers for joining us today. We're incredibly grateful. Ambassador Roberto Azevedo, it's a great honor for us to host you uh, here at WIDA. Your team has been a pleasure to work with, and we're very grateful for your joining us today. Special thanks. I'd like to just take a minute and thank our sponsors. They are listed in your program. Our leadership sponsor, UPS, our benefactors, General Motors, the National Pork Producers Council, and the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center, as well as the patrons of today's conference, Ducey, Mastriani, and Schomburg, Americans for Prosperity, the American Apparel and Footwear Association, Ernst & Young, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, the Information Technology Industry Council, Mondelez International, Mitchell, Silverberg, and Nup LLP, the National Retail Federation, Pacific Pension and Investment Institute, Trade Data Monitor, and UNO Trade. Uh, your support for this event and all our events throughout the year, uh, incredibly important to us to be able to continue the trade education that we do uh, throughout the year, and we're very grateful to all of you. I'm going to run through quickly just the day, what to expect for the day. We have a pretty packed morning. Coffee will be available outside the room. And we'll have some brief five-minute breaks that uh, you can use to get coffee or go to the restrooms. The restrooms are back and to the right. There's a sign over there. Coffee's available all day if you want to step out and get coffee at any time. Um, we also have a conference room area in the back if outside the room. If people want to go in, if they need to take a call or have a conversation, please use that space to do that. Um, we're going to try to stick to a strict schedule as much as we can today. So please try to get back to your seats for each of the starts of our sessions. We'll have a lunch buffet at 12.15. I'll give you directions then on how to use, work through the 30 minutes we have for the buffet before sitting back down for lunch. 
Um, this afternoon, we have a 30-minute networking and coffee break. That was uh, from the conference last year. That was one of the learnings we had, was that everybody wanted more time to chat with their friends. So we'll have time for that this afternoon. Um, when we get to, uh, for each of our discussants, we'll have time for questions. Um, ask you to identify yourselves, give your name and affiliation, and please try to keep your questions on topic and relevant to the rest of the room. And last, a couple quick notes for the many press who are in the room today. Uh, remarks on the stage are all on the record, uh, but discussions among, around the room among the attendees are off the record unless you're explicitly told otherwise. Um, and for everybody, um, I know that a lot of the people who are speaking are friends and people you want to speak with. If you'd like to do that or if you'd like to have the press have any questions for them, please see them outside the room um, where there's plenty of room for you to have a conversation. Uh, if you, and if they wish to speak further on the record, uh, you can ask them that directly. Um, we, uh, we were expecting Ambassador Susan Schwab to be here right now. She's got stuck in the rainy traffic and is running just a couple of minutes late. Uh, so I'm going to take the moment and uh, uh, we're going to introduce Ambassador Acevedo in just a moment. But before we do that, um, we'd like to take a moment uh, at WIDA to remember a longtime friend of WIDA, a longtime friend of many of you in the room, uh, Ambassador Michael Moore. Uh, Ambassador Michael Moore, the former ambassador to New Zealand, the former prime minister of New Zealand, and the former director general of the World Trade Organization, passed away on Sunday. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like everyone just to take a moment of silence to remember Ambassador Moore. Thank you, everybody, for that moment. Um, Ambassador Moore was uh, the, w the, the Director General of the WTO at a very interesting time, as many of you will remember. Uh, I believe it was 99 to 2002. Um, there was the, the battle in Seattle, the launching of the Doha Round, China's entry into the World Trade Organization. I would say one of the most monumental times in the history of the World Trade Organization that he lived through. I guess we were honored to be able to have him here in Washington for so many years as well to help uh, launch uh, one of the, the launching the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations and a great friend of many of you. Um, he helped build up this fantastic organization and we're delighted to have today uh, Roberto Acevedo join us here today. Um, Ambassador Acevedo, it is a distinct privilege and a high honor for WIDA to welcome you to speak to our membership. We are all, as um, I think I mentioned to you pre pre when I, I saw you outside, uh, strong supporters of the multilateral trading system. And while there are critics uh, of uh, some of the, the things that have been going on at the World Trade Organization from some parts of the, the community in Washington, and certainly uh, both Democratic and Republican administrations over the years, um, we are still supporters of the multilateral trading system. WIDA is a supporter of trade, and we are very, very grateful and for the work you do and for the work of your organization, and uh, couldn't be more pleased than to invite you to come and give some remarks to our membership today. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone, and. Uh, Washington was my very first diplomatic posting, so I have very fond memories of the place. Um, and it's always a pleasure to come back, so let me start by thanking Wita uh, and all of you for inviting me to be with you. Um, and just like um, it was done just a moment ago, I'd like to start my comments um, by paying tribute uh, to former WTO Director General Mike Moore who passed away this weekend after prolonged illnesses. So prior uh, to his term, as you know, um, in, 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 uh, uh, in the WTO, uh, Mike Moore, uh, he served as Prime Minister, Minister of Trade for his country. He ended his distinguished uh, career in terms of public services uh, in this country as Ambassador uh, of New Zealand. He was deeply committed um, to the WTO, uh, more than that, to a WTO that worked for all members regardless of their size. Um, so our thoughts and prayers 
uh, go out uh, to his family and friends. Now let's talk about the global trading system. Um, and the one that we have grown accustomed to um, over the past 70 years uh, was not built by accident, as you all know. So it was deliberately constructed um, out of uh, hard-learned understanding, uh, the understanding uh, that absent cooperation in international economic relations, everyone is left worse off and growth opportunities are lost. And I'm not here, don't worry, to deliver a history lesson uh, on the multilateral trading system. There are many people in the room who could do a better job. Um, what I do want is to emphasize um, that the value uh, that is provided uh, by the system is quite plain to see. Um, and this, this, um, this value extends uh, well beyond peace, prosperity, interdependence uh, fostered by trade. Uh, businesses and consumers benefit every day you know, from the certainty and predictability uh, that is provided for access to products and markets. Now, an interesting figure is that over 75%, so three quarters of current uh, world uh, merchandise trade um, happens on the WTO's non-discriminatory MFN terms, so most favored nation. And that is, of course, considering the EU as a single economy. So three quarters. All the other bilateral, regional, uh, and other preferential agreements together account for around 20%. Now, even under these preferential terms, the WTO rules are still present providing the stability and predictability at the base. Now, when trade flows smoothly, of course, it helps the economic engines running. The recent erosion on predictability and certainty has made the system's value even more evident. Now, can we live without predictability in trading conditions? Absolutely. Now, the world is not going to end because of trade policy uncertainty, that's for sure. But there will be a price to pay. Without predictability, growth and job creation would be slower, more fragile, than they would have been with the kind of predictability and certainty that the system provides. Investment and consumption decisions would be postponed, many of them indefinitely. Now, all this would translate into lower productivity and diminished future potential. Now, modestly, go, um, modest, modestly lower uh, economic growth uh, might not seem a big thing if we're talking of changes from one year to the next. Uh, but over a decade, that makes a difference. It will let up. Over a generation, the gaps would become dramatic. Uh, our children and grandchildren's economic prospects will be significantly worse than they could have been. In the event of a serious downturn, the short-term costs of unpredictability in trading relations would rise quite sharply. So governments providing fiscal or monetary stimulus would be very tempted to add protectionism to their growth-promoting strategies, undoubtedly compromising their original gains, uh, uh, aims. Now, the collective result would be to weaken precisely the effectiveness of everyone's recession-fighting measures. So the multilateral trading system is worth keeping, but does that mean keeping it as it is? Um, I don't think so. Clearly, there are areas where it could improve, in fact, where it must improve. In the 25 years since the WTO was created, global trade tripled in volume. Trade barriers have fallen. Poverty rates have hit historic lows. And the world has changed in ways that we could scarcely have been thinking about uh, back then. Look around. The main actors have changed in the global economy. They have different economic models. The bulk of the WTO rules, ba um, rules book dates back uh, to the Uruguay round. Now, these negotiations were concluded in Marrakesh back in April of 1994. Now, that's 40 years before Google was even founded. Now, what this means, for sure, for the WTO, 
is that for the system to endure as an effective, um, an effective agent uh, in the years ahead, it will need to adapt. And adapting to changing realities will not be a big bang. It will be a continuous, perpetual process. Now, I have been saying this since I first took office back in 2013, that the system has to deliver more and deliver quickly. Its rules must cover more aspects of the cross-border economic activity. And we have been doing just this. The Trade Facilitation Agreement, concluded in 2013, is a boost to global transactions that could lift trade by about $1 trillion. In 2015, members agreed to eliminate agricultural export subsidies, so that removed a major distortion in farm trade. That same year, a group of 50 members agreed to expand the Plurilateral Information Technology Agreement, cutting tariffs on $1.3 trillion worth of touchscreens, new generation microchips, GPS equipment, and other infotech products that didn't exist back in 1996 when the agreement was first signed. Now, these were important changes for sure, but they are not enough. We need to go much further. And unless we do, gray areas in trade rules will keep expanding. They are not static. They keep expanding, and they will become fodder for tension. Now, in fact, some of the unconventional policies and bilateral arrangements that we see today might have never been arisen uh, had we done more uh, to update the system. Now, the impasse on dispute settlement is a case in point. Uh, the impasse uh, that many members, in fact, not only the United States, uh, results from the fact that all those members were dissatisfied uh, with different aspects of how the appellate body was operating. So it is my hope that members will use the current crisis uh, to produce an improved uh, two-step appeals process. Evolution and reinvention have been a big part of the multilateral trading system since its creation in the 1940s. It has incorporated new members, new issues. Governments have found new and creative ways of doing things, from the plurilateral codes um, on subsidies and other non-tariff policies um, to, the created, um, to the creation um, of rules in new areas like services, intellectual property. Uh, and that's why I'm pleased to be able to report that away from the, you know, the main gloomy headlines that we see out there, WTO members are once again advancing on multiple fronts. So at the multilateral level where all of them uh, work together, they're working to reach an agreement that would curb fishery subsidies and contribute to the health of our oceans. They're also looking at how to liberalize and reduce distortions in agriculture trade. At the same time, groups of WTO members, so not all of them, but pretty significant groups of 80 countries or more, they are exploring a potential uh, future rules on investment facilitation, on electronic commerce, and on domestic regulations that can unnecessarily obstruct services trade. Now these, we call them <coughs> joint statement initiatives, and they tackle issues that are at the heart of the 21st century economy. They also represent a quiet revolution in the way that governments negotiate at the WTO. Like-minded members are free to pursue issues without being held back by others, but at the same time, no one is compelled to sign up anything that they don't want to. Now, the e-commerce talks, for example, they bring together 82 members, and they account for about 90% about, uh, of global trade, and that includes the US, the EU, China, and of course, establishing joint rules uh, for uh, that area uh, would facilitate electronic transactions and digital trade, but not only that, it could also help manage wider tensions over technology. For all of those processes that I have just mentioned, the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference that is going to happen in June in Kazakhstan will be a critical landmark, delivering an impressive cluster of new rules um, is clearly within reach of members. Now, these could go a long way, preparing the WTO for the next 25 years. Of course, the real question now is not 
whether we need changes at the WTO. The real question is whether we can make the changes that we need. Now, the fact is that changing multilateral institutions is hard, and it is doubly hard for institutions like the WTO, where every tweak in the rules has a concrete, very concrete economic impact, threatening some interests um, as it creates opportunities for others. Technical experts sitting in Geneva cannot do it themselves. We need political leadership, involvement, it's either this or we have to prepare to pay for the consequences. Now, for my part, I have been talking to leaders every chance I get. Uh, the G20 for one has endorsed WTO reform, others have two. Now, getting the WTO's 164 members to agree by consensus is always complex, but global, global problems require global solutions. Now, looking ahead, I'm sure that WTO members are ready for change. There are no doubts about that. They are thinking differently. They are doing things differently. They want to improve the system we have. They don't want to throw it away and attempt to start from scratch. We have a solid foundation, one that has fostered growth, development, and increased purchasing power over the decades. So the reality is we need very significant changes just a few coats of paint will not be enough. We need structural changes. Now, all of you here today have a role to play, businesses, academics, government officials. We need your engagement. It's not enough to say nice things about the system. That's not supporting the system, by the way. Criticizing it, even if it's constructive criticism, is not enough either, sorry to say. To modernize the WTO, we will need vision, determination, more than anything, we'll need to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of an audible. Um, Ambassador Susan Schwab, who's going to be joining us uh, today, uh, got stuck in traffic, and we've been hoping she'd be here in time for the, remark the uh, remarks. My good friend Rufus Yerksa, the president of the National Foreign Trade Council, who will also be joining us later in the day, uh, has agreed, and <laughs> former Deputy Director General, <laughs> please sit, uh, has agreed to stand in for Susan. Thank you, uh, Rufus, for stepping in. And uh, uh, Mr. Azevedo, thank you so much for joining us. I forgot to mention, uh, WIDA once hosted a 70th anniversary of the GATT party. Oh. So I think we may have been the only ones in the world who had a GATT birthday party, <laughs> um, complete with a cake. So uh, we are big supporters, and thank you very much. Rufus, thank you for stepping in. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to see Susan in a few minutes, so I'll try to pinch hit by sort of throwing a few softballs at you, uh, Mr. Director General. Roberto, thank you so much for coming to Washington, taking time to talk to us. You know, there is an enormous interest in this town in what's going on in Geneva and how we can move forward with the WTO and what the U.S. role in the WTO is in relationship. I wonder if you could speak for a moment to the importance of uh, leadership, not just from the U.S., but from the other big players in the system, if you're really going to have um, a chance at uh, accomplishing meaningful reform in the system. Yeah. Well, first of all, again, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks for standing in for Susan. Um, last night I was waiting for the results of the primary. And the <laughs> now I'm waiting for Susan. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, and, you know, you and, for, and for WTO reform, so. You thought you were, were going to get Susan and you way. got me, so that's the way America works. Now. There's always a, a good, uh, you know, lining in everything. So, look, I think leadership is fundamental for uh, reform simply because, as I said just a moment ago, 
if we really want to reform the system, it's not going to be at the margins. I mean, it's not going to be a touch here or a touch there. It does require some pretty structural uh, rethinking, and that kind of thing cannot be done in Geneva by you know a bunch of experts sitting around the table. They're very good, by the way. I was one of them mm -hmm. uh, a while back. Uh, there are many sitting here in the room, so I'm not downplaying their role. Their role is absolutely critical, but you know they can only carry the ball so far. At some point in time, you do need the political, you know, engagement and push that is necessary to to get that kind of change going. The the frame of mind and the, you know the mindset changing. Mm -hmm. A lot in Geneva, it's about the mindset. If people don't believe that we are actually going to change things. They're going to say the right things, they're going to do the right things, but they're not going to really commit and uh, take the risks that are necessary for that kind of um, endeavor. So that's where the political leadership comes in. And um, I'm, I hear a lot of um, commitment on the part of leaders. Um, we have to see how far uh, we can go with that. At fir first, I think what we need to do is have an agreement on what are the things that we want to change? What are the things that are missing? Um, and that's the conversation that I think we need to have. And from your point of view, um, I mean, I don't think you should try to give us a laundry list of what's missing, because obviously the, the members will have to decide that by developing the agenda. But what are your hopes for the ministerial meeting in Nur Sultan? I'm getting used to that new name. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think that that can give some real impetus to reform if the, if the leaders of the world handle it properly? Well, there are, I mean, if you look at No Sultan, there are some clear things that may happen. I think fishery subsidies is one of them. Um, maybe a, a kind of a roadmap or a conceptual way forward for agriculture. I think without agriculture, any kind of exercise in the WTO that means deep reforms is going to be compromised. Um, and you have these uh, joint initiatives, right, where you have the, what we call plurilaterals. It simply means not all members are part of it. Most of them are. And that uh, includes um, very important negotiations, actually. One on electronic commerce is advancing quite, quite well, not easily well. Um, facilitation of investments is another one. Um, domestic regulation for services. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pretty significant stuff. Uh, people are developing there. And I think deliverables in these areas are clearly possible by uh, Nur Sultan. But when you talk about reform, I mean, there are some more structural things that I think we need to consider. I think the first one is dispute settlement. We clearly have a problem with dispute settlement, mm -hmm. which is a fundamental piece. People in Geneva hear often, and I sympathize with the notion that why are we going to negotiate rules if we don't have an enforcement mechanism? Uh, so there is some um, urgency in fixing that, and I think that's part of the reform because this, that's very structural. And I don't think that you, for a while in Geneva, people were saying, okay, so what does it take to, to, to resume the process of nominating appellate body members, right? I don't think that is enough. I, I think most likely we're going to have structural changes on how the appellate body operates and uh, and how the dispute settlement mechanism operates in general. So it's get, it has to be a much more structural <coughs> um, change if we are going to resume the process at all. Let me ask you just to speak for a moment. I mean, this is a crowd that obviously has people from all kinds of businesses, um, US-based foreign parent, global companies, um, a lot of interests all around the world. Speak to them for a moment, not about the particulars of how you would fix the appellate body, but what about the larger importance of dispute settlement and an effective dispute settlement system uh, within the WTO? Uh, you know, there's always been this very real tension in the U.S. between um, some uh, surrender of our sovereignty to an international set of rules in exchange for the kind of certainty and predictability you get from being able to enforce it on others. So I, I wonder if you could just talk to this audience a little bit about why they should care about dispute settlement. Well, the first thing is dispute settlement is a way to depoliticize 
things and to diminish tensions. Uh, often the, the disputes that you see at the WTO, they're not technical disputes about you know, the interests of a company or another or a sector or another. They involve pretty significant political tensions uh, behind that. Um, so instead of escalating the disputes or the, the differences into a political nightmare, which often happens, and we're seeing some of that happening, uh, it happened clearly in the 80s, which created the system. Um, what you do is you kind of outsource the political problems to a legal, juridical discussion, right? And that has happened in a very uh, efficient manner for a number of years. Um, I have to say that I sympathize with some criticism that disputes are taking longer to resolve, they are heavier, they're more expensive, um, and the system was supposed to be more nimble, more agile, uh, and less political, if you want. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to go back to that. And I think that's where um, the conversations in Geneva are going at this point in time. Um, I am, look, in my mind, I can see a much better uh, dispute settlement uh, system functioning, um, but my thinking is not enough. I think I need members to actually sit down and, and get it done. But I. I'm pretty confident that we, if we have all the players on board, we, we can do it. So just recently there was a, a bit of a dust up over um, the budget of the WTO Secretariat mm -hmm. stemming largely from this pellet body crisis. Um, you've been Director General now for what, seven years? Seven years, yeah. Uh, I'd like for you to just get a chance to speak a little bit about uh, the WTO as an institution and what you've learned from, from running it and, and how you feel about the, the strength and the um, durability of that institution. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, that's a critical point. Um, and I have to say, uh, I think often people miss the point. And, and, and I'll be very, very, very frank with you and, and open. Uh, I'll take that risk. Uh, we, look, if I take a regular car, you know, a car that you see on the street every day, and if, if, and if I drive it into a lake, what is going to happen? It's going to sink, right? It was not built to cross a lake and over the surface of the lake. That was not what it was built for. Now, the WTO was not built to change economic models of countries. It's just not the purpose of the system. It was not built to do it. If you want a system that does that, it's a different system. Okay, you go back to 1947, you do something different. You go back to 1995, do something different, or you do something different now. Um, what the WTO does ensure is that it eliminates a number of potential distortions that regardless of the model, the economic model or political model of the country, can introduce in trade relations. It does uh, somehow level the playing field and avoids those kind of distortions. Now, some people would expect that with the rules you have today, if you just follow those rules, 164 countries would have the same political economic model. That's just not true. It's just not true. And it would be unrealistic to expect that. So if you want to address that problem, you need new rules. You need a completely set uh, of rules. Maybe you expand the rules, you cover the gray areas, and the gray areas, what is a gray area? Is, a gr is an area where you didn't think about it, and now people are using that. Uh, the loopholes, you know, the, 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 the gaps uh, in the rules, you have to close them. Now, how you close them, with what uh, intent, uh, that's a different conversation. Now, that is tough. That is tough, because the economic model of a country um, goes way beyond trade, way beyond trade. The WTO is about trade. That's the name of the organization, World Trade Organization. Now, if you want to handle trade, I think we have very important tools there, and we can manage with a lot of that, and we can complete that. If you want more than that, then you need a different organization, maybe a World Trade Plus organization, but just trade organizations are going to do it. But if you look at the history over time, 
um, and I agree with everything you said about you need a different organization if you want to do that, but we have strengthened the system and closed a lot of yes. gaps. I'm thinking of, you know, your original predecessor, the first director general of the GATT, William Wyndham White, who once described the GATT as a series of loopholes tied together with waivers. Um, <laughs> It's certainly better than that now, isn't it? It is. We, we have managed to do a lot, um, and we can do more. But all I'm saying is it's not going to happen by accident. Mm -hmm. It's not all of a sudden somebody in Geneva sits down and says, oh, why do, how, how about closing this loophole here? And then everybody sits down, yeah, okay, let's do that, and that's fine. Now that's a good idea. It's not going to happen like that. It's going to be a major, it's going to require a major political push to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen by accident. And you, all of you here, have a role in that. Political push also don't come out of nothing. They take businesses, academia, officers, you know, uh, government officials, sitting down, banging their heads together and saying, we need something new. We need something new. And then sensitize those who can actually provide that political impetus to do it. And, well, I'll be there for another year only, huh? by the way. So I will leave that to my successor uh, at some point in time. But this is, this is the moment to start, I think, because the, the collective understanding that this is something big and this is something that needs to happen is there. So let's not waste that opportunity. I'm just doing a reality check here. Should we? We have, we have a couple minutes to take some questions. Um, Good. So we have a couple mic runners. Uh, folks can raise their hands, identify themselves. Uh, I see one here. Right up front here. Please identify yourself, Selena. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Selena Jackson from Procter & Gamble. Nice to see you, Mr. Director General. Um, and. Rufus, you're prettier than Susan, so th <laughs> thanks for standing in. Um, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roberto, what about the role of the U.S. in the reform? I understand you met with uh, the president in Davos. Uh, what comes next? Well, I think what comes next is a continuation of the conversation at some point in time, and uh, I'm in touch with uh, the USTR. You know, Bob Lighthizer is, uh, is, is my interlocutor. We have been uh, thinking and brainstorming about many things, so there is engagement uh, politically in the U.S. Uh, what we need is to transform those ideas into concrete uh, action. Um, but that's a conversation that needs to go a bit deeper, as you can imagine, the conversation with President Trump was superficial in nature. That's, that's the way it is uh, with uh, every conversation I have with, uh, with a, you know, a president or prime minister. We don't expect to go with them in detail. Uh, but what was important was the perception that um, there is a need to change uh, what we have and that we need to do it. Um, what comes next? is precisely the question that uh, we all need an answer to. Right here. Hi, Director General Penny Noss, UPS. Um, question for you. You talked a little bit about trade and what it can and can't do. So there's also some conversations on trade in the environment, trade in women, <laughs> trade in small and medium-sized enterprises. Just wanted to query you a little bit on where those efforts stand in terms of Nur Sultan, and any thoughts you have about what role the trade rules can play in those areas? Well, clearly, uh, trade and environment, I mean, there is the conversation on fishery subsidies, so that's clearly an environmental issue, so a sustainability uh, issue that we are facing now and that I'm hopeful that we can get some of that done uh, by Nur Sultan. Um, there are conversations about um, clean technologies, an agreement on clean technologies and something and things like that. Maybe you can see in Nur Sultan a launch or a um, preparation for negotiations in that direction. This is a conversation that is going on, uh, but I cannot tell you uh, that I know what is going to happen in Nur Sultan. I think that depends on how things evolve. Women, there is a joint statement on um, empowerment uh, of women, and I am 
very, very excited about that. Uh, I know that um, not a whole lot of ideas have come forward yet in terms of making that a concrete proposal or something like that, although some companies, I'm sure you're familiar with them, uh, have been uh, doing precisely that, which is very welcome, by the way. We just need more um, engagement in Geneva. Some of that is happening a little bit outside the WTO, uh, so we are, well, hoping for the proponents or co-proponents to bring it more squarely into the uh, uh, MC12 effort, uh, but we are very confident that if, the, if it does come, that we can get some pretty good uh, results uh, from that one as well. And th there are many other things as well that people are talking about. Small and medium enterprises is another one, but I think that fits into many of the boxes that we're working with um, and other things as well. I see, I think we have time for one more way back in the back there. Good morning, Andrea Shalal with Reuters. I wanted to ask you to follow up on what you just said about the meeting with President Trump. Um, why was it not possible for you to meet with the President during this visit? We're just a couple blocks from the White House. Um, did you seek a meeting? Was that refused? And then secondly, yesterday the Commerce Department finalized rules that um, um, basically allow them to assess, uh, to impose duties if they determine that a country is purposely undervaluing its currency and taking action to undervalue its currency in combination in an action that would hurt uh, domestic U.S. industries. Um, do you believe, some critics have said, that would be in violation of WTO rules? Do you believe that's the case? Thanks. Well, I'll start with the second one. Uh, <laughs> there is a, even a group uh, in Geneva, it's a working group on trade and finance, um, trade debt and finance, and they discuss precisely the issue of um, uh, currency uh, exchange rates. Um, it's, it's, it's a very complex conversation because even though the WTO rules mention uh, the issue of uh, exchange rates, uh, it is widely recognized in the organization that it's very rare that you see exchange rate policy being driven by trade. Uh, trade is just one small uh, aspect of that conversation. Most, um, you know, uh, exchange rate values, they are determined on the basis of uh, macroeconomic policies that include fiscal, monetary um, choices with goals that go way beyond the balance of, um, um, of the, the, current, the trade accounts. So it is, again, like I said, if, if you're going to get this car to fix currency, it's going, to, it's going to fail. It's going to sink in the lake. It's not going to do that. You have the IMF, you have the, you know, the World Bank, you have a, the central banks, uh, the Financial Stability Board. They're all talking about this. I mean, uh, to expect that the WTO is going to fix this, that will be a bit uh, ambitious, I would say, uh, to place that on the shoulders of the organization. Uh, it was not built for that. It was not done for that. You want to do that, fine, but then change it. Give rules, give something different, give a chapter on that in the rules. And that's not impossible, but you need to do that. Uh, not with a, a couple of sentences in the agreements, you're not going to fix it. That, that's the way I see it. Um, wh why am I not speaking to President Trump this time around? Uh, I came here for this event and I'm taking off this afternoon. It doesn't mean that I can't come back. You know, there's air travel and all that stuff. <laughs> so I can come back, no problem. But I need somebody to tell me this is the time. And I suppose the, the time here uh, in the U.S. is, well, it's, things are pretty busy here uh, for a number of reasons. So uh, while in, in, in Davos, I suppose um, President Trump um, had a few moments, you know, to have this conversation here, it may be tougher to schedule something like that. But anyway, I am, I am in constant contact um, with um, the USTR, and I'm, I'm sure that they are thinking about this too. We are not, um, we're not downplaying this at all, and I think there is a sense of urgency here as well. 
uh, but we have to realize that um, there are other things playing uh, and taking up uh, people's time uh, right now as well. So, like I said, I'll be ready. We'll be ready. Roberto, I remember a, an a earlier director general once said that the most important task of a director general is to be an honest broker. And uh, I think you've demonstrated over your tenure uh, how important that role is and how well you've played it. We'd like to thank you for coming here and thank you for your leadership in the WTO.